Welcome back to Twisted Tales of Murder. Serial killers are a topic that have fascinated people for centuries, making us question how and why they do the things they do. This is part one of the serial killer iceberg explained. Each week, I will dive into the lives of five serial killers and an honorable mention, from the most well-known killers to the obscure. I will explain the murders and the events in these killers' lives with facts that even the most dedicated crime buff may not know. Each week, there will be a different theme. For now, I will reveal it at the end of the video. Then, after I have enough subscribers, I will post a contest where you can submit your guest, and the first person to guess correctly will win a cash prize. So remember to subscribe. Disclaimer, some of this information and images are gruesome and disturbing. Now, for our iceberg. Now, without further delay, our first serial killer is none other than the Milwaukee cannibal or the Milwaukee monster, Jeffrey Dahmer, who was the American serial killer and sex offender who killed and dismembered 17 males between 1978 and 1991 and is one of the scariest serial killers, not only for his gruesome murders, but also what he did afterwards with the body. Before we dive into his crimes, let's look at how Jeffrey Dahmer grew up. Jeffrey Dahmer was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin on May 21st, 1960. That makes his zodiac sign a Gemini, also known as having two personalities. His parents were Lowell and Joyce Dahmer, and he was described as an energetic and happy child until the age of four, after he had a traumatic and painful recovery after his surgery, which seemed to change him forever. From this point on, he became noticeably subdued and withdrawn, and this only became worse after the birth of his younger brother. Jeffrey and his little brother David were separated after his parents got divorced in 1978. There's little to no information about David, since he legally changed his name to start a new life. The only thing that was discussed by Jeffrey's father was that David had a career and a family. From a young age, Dahmer developed a fascination with animal bones and studied how to clean and preserve them. As a child, he collected large insects and the skulls of small animals, preserving them in formaldehyde. It is said that there are childhood and adolescent behaviors that do correlate with the development of serial sexual murderers, starting with the preoccupation of sadist fantasies and the compulsion to act on them. Animal cruelty is also a component, and Dahmer is reported saying, I poured some gasoline on them and set it on fire. If you want to call that torturing animals, okay, I tortured animals. Dahmer's childhood was not without problems. His mother, Joyce, suffered from depression and attempted suicide, and his father was preoccupied with his doctoral work in chemistry. By his early teens, Dahmer claimed that his compulsions towards necrophilia and murder began around the age of 14. But it appears that the breakdown of his parents' marriage and their divorce a few years later might have been the catalyst for turning these thoughts into actions. In early adolescence, Dahmer had an off-the-charts libido and constantly fantasized about doing harm, more specifically, killing men and having sex with their corpses. At the age of 13, Dahmer tried to actualize his imagination. He'd become overwhelmingly infatuated with a male jogger in his hometown, and one day he hid with a baseball bat near the jogger's roof, hoping to make his first kill. But the man didn't jog that day, so Dahmer moved on. Dahmer also started drinking at age 14, and by the time of his first killing, at the age of 18, his alcohol consumption had spun out of control. Although Dahmer did not have any close friends, he was considered the class clown in high school, photobombing several yearbook photos and pretending to have seizures that his classmates called doing a Dahmer. Three weeks after graduating from high school, Jeffrey Dahmer committed his first murder. Dahmer killed an 18-year-old hitchhiker named Stephen Hicks by hitting him over the head with a dumbbell. 
After this criminal incident, it took Dahmer almost a decade before he killed his next victim. After graduating high school and committing his first murder, Dahmer began at Ohio State University to pursue a major in business, but got expelled in the first semester due to a drinking problem and poor grades. It is still thought that Dahmer haunts his old dorm room. In late December of 1978, Dahmer's father insisted that he join the army, so he enlisted and shortly thereafter was posted in Germany. Dahmer's drinking problem persisted, and in the early 1981, the army discharged him. Although German authorities would later investigate possible connections between Dahmer and murders that took place in the area, it is not believed that he took any victims while serving in the armed forces. Following his discharge, Dahmer returned home to Ohio, and an arrest later that year for disorderly conduct prompted his father to send Dahmer to live with his grandmother in Wisconsin. But his alcohol problem continued, and he was arrested the following summer for indecent exposure. He was arrested once again in 1986 when two boys accused him of masturbating in front of them. He only received one year probation. Dahmer worked many odd jobs. He worked at a deli in Florida. He worked at the Milwaukee Plasma Center as a phlebotomist. And he also worked as a mixer for a chocolate factory in Milwaukee, where he kept one of his victim's heads in his locker. Drinking was always a theme in Dahmer's life. He explained that to murder his victims, he needed to drink alcohol because he didn't want to kill them. In his exact words, it was a means to an end. This fact caused the families of his victims to try and sue Budweiser. They claimed that the company's advertisements played a key role in Dahmer's alcoholism, which led to his crimes. The lawsuit did not win. However, another beer company named Theory made a pack of beers called the Murder Box dedicated to Dahmer and other serial killers. Of course, people criticized this company for their mind-boggling marketing campaign and they went out of business. Jeffrey Dahmer murdered 17 men between 1978 and 1991. He was careful to select victims on the fringe of society, making their disappearance less noticeable and reducing the likelihood of his capture. He lured these men to his home with the promise of money or sex and then strangled them to death. He then engaged with sexual acts with their dead bodies and kept their body parts and photos as souvenirs. Dahmer's first murder was an 18-year-old hitchhiker named Stephen Hicks. Dahmer took him to his parents' house, where they proceeded to get drunk, and when Hicks wanted to leave, Dahmer said, I don't want you to go, and killed him by striking him in the back of the head with a barbell. Dahmer then dismembered his corpse, packing the body parts in plastic bags that he buried behind his parents' home. He later exhumed the remains, crushing the bones with a sledgehammer and scattering them across a wooded area. It would be another nine years before Dahmer killed again. September 1987 was when Dahmer took his second victim, Stephen Toomey. They checked into a hotel room and drank, and Dahmer eventually awoke to find Toomey dead. With no memory of the previous night, Dahmer later told police he intended to drug Toomey but not kill him, and then he couldn't believe this had happened to him. So Dahmer brought a large suitcase to transport his body to his grandmother's basement, where he dismembered and masturbated on the corpse before disposing of the remains. He kept Toomey's head wrapped in a blanket for weeks after the murder. Dahmer later said after killing Toomey, his obsession with killing went into full swing and he didn't even want to try to stop. He killed two more victims at his grandmother's house before she forced him to move out in 1988. She said she had no knowledge of the crimes, but was tired of his drinking and his tendency to bring m men home to the house. Oh, and she also complained about the foul smell coming from the basement. Yes, he kept dead bodies in the basement. In September 1989, about a year after moving into his new apartment, 
Dahmer lured a 14-year-old boy to his house, claiming he wanted to take nude photos of him. This resulted in charges of sexual exploitation and second-degree sexual assault for Dahmer. He pled guilty, claiming that the boy appeared much older. While awaiting sentencing for his sexual assault case, Dahmer put his grandmother's basement to gruesome use once again. In March of 1989, he lured, drugged, stabbed, sodomized, photographed, dismembered, and disposed of Anthony Sears' body. Sears was an aspiring model. Dahmer found him particularly attractive and later said he didn't want to lose him. And so Sears became the first victim from whom Dahmer kept preserved for a long time after, mummifying his head and genitals and consuming parts of him. At his trial for child molestation in May of 1989, his defense counsel argued that he needed treatment, not incarceration, and the judge agreed, handing down a one-year prison sentence on day release allowing Dahmer to work at his job during the day and return to the prison at night, as well as five years probation. Over the next two years, Dahmer would kill 12 more people, bringing his total victim count to 17. His first victim during this time was a prostitute named Raymond Smith, whom Dahmer lured to his apartment for sex, gave him a drink laced with sleeping tablets, and then strangled him. Dahmer took photos of his body in suggestive positions before dismembering him. With his next victim, Edward Smith, Dahmer accidentally destroyed his skull while trying to dry it in the oven, making it explode. He later told police he felt rotten about Smith's murder because he was unable to keep anything from his body making it, in Dahmer's eyes, a waste. It was after Smith's murder that Dahmer started developing rituals as he progressed with his killings, experimenting with chemical means of disposal and often consuming the flesh of his victims. Dahmer also attempted crude lobotomies. He would drill into the skull of his 11th victim, Earl Lindsay, while he was still alive and injected him with acid. Dahmer hoped this would place Lindsay in a permanent submissive state. But Lindsay awoke during the procedure and said, I have a headache. What time is it? So Dahmer strangled and killed him. On May 27, 1991, Dahmer's neighbor, Sandra Smith. Is anybody else noticing lots of people with the last name of Smith? Anyways, Sandra called the police to report that an Asian boy was running naked in the street. When the police arrived, the boy was incoherent, and they accepted the word of Dahmer, a white man in a largely poor Black community. They believed that the boy was Dahmer's 19-year-old lover, when in fact, remember the boy that Dahmer molested in 1989? This was his younger brother. He was only 14 at the time of his death. If the police had done something to help him, they would have saved his life. Instead, the police escorted Dahmer and the boy back to Dahmer's home, clearly not wishing to become embedded in a homosexual domestic disturbance. They took only a slight look around the living room, and according to Dahmer, the officer peeked his head around in the bedroom, but didn't really take a good look, and then left after telling Dahmer to take care of the boy. Once they left the scene, Dahmer injected hydrochloric acid into the boy's brain, killing him. Had the police conducted even a basic search, they would have found the body of Dahmer's 12th victim, Tony Hughes, which was still in his bedroom. The fact that Dahmer assaulted and killed one of two brothers from the same family has been regarded as a horrifying coincidence, one that the family has never recovered from. Dahmer killed four more men before he was finally arrested. In 1991, Dahmer traveled to Chicago to attend a gay pride parade. 
It was there that he met Turner, who was waiting at the bus station. Turner accepted Dahmer's offer to travel to Milwaukee for a professional photo shoot. At his apartment, Dahmer drugged, strangled, and dismembered Turner and placed his head and internal organs in separate plastic bags in his freezer. Unfortunately, Turner was never reported missing. Jeremiah Weinberger encountered Dahmer in Chicago. The two men took a Greyhound bus back to Milwaukee from Chicago. However, Weinberger's weekend getaway quickly went south after Dahmer drugged him and injected boiling water into his skull. The injection put Weinberger into a coma and he died two days later. When Dahmer's experiment failed, he strangled him. He severed his head and placed it in the freezer. Then Dahmer dismembered his body with a chainsaw and stored his torso in a 75 gallon blue drum that he filled with acid. Weinberger was last seen on July 6th of 1991. My question is, how did nobody in his apartment complex hear a chainsaw? I can hear my neighbor sneeze. This was probably another opportunity where the police could have stopped him. Oliver Lacey was a father of two children and was engaged to be married. He was 24 when he met Dahmer in July of 1991 and went missing shortly thereafter. Dahmer introduced himself as a professional photographer and quickly charmed the aspiring bodybuilder. Lacey then went with, da with Dahmer to his home for a photo shoot, but he was quickly drugged and strangled to death. Dahmer had sex with his body before dismembering the corpse. He kept Lacey's head and heart in the refrigerator and a skeleton in the freezer. Joseph Branford had a wife and three children in Minnesota. He left for a job interview on July 16th of 1991 and never returned. He met Dahmer at a bus stop near the Marquette University campus, and he would become Dahmer's final victim. Dahmer's killing spree ended when he was arrested on July 22nd of 1991. The body parts found in Dahmer's refrigerator and the Polaroid photos of his victims were the key and gruesome evidence in this madman's life. Tracy Edwards would have been Dahmer's 18th victim, but he escaped. The Milwaukee man spent a nightmarish four hours in Jeffrey Dahmer's apartment before escaping and eventually leading authorities to the serial killer. Although Edwards was able to escape Dahmer, he would not escape the nightmare that would haunt him. Two Milwaukee police officers were led to Dahmer's apartment when they picked up Edwards, a 32-year-old black man who was wandering the streets with handcuffs dangling from his wrist. They decided to investigate the man's claim that a weird dude had drugged and restrained him. When they arrived at Dahmer's apartment, he calmly offered to get the keys to the handcuffs. Edwards claimed that the knife Dahmer had threatened him with was in the bedroom, and the officers went to corroborate the story. They noticed Polaroid photos of dismembered bodies laying around. Dahmer was then subdued by the officers, after which he muttered the words, For what I did, I should be dead. Subsequent searches of Dahmer's property revealed a head in the refrigerator, three more in the freezer, in a catalog of other horrors, including preserved skulls, jars of his victim's genitalia, and an exclusive gallery of Polaroid photographs of his victims. Dahmer later said that he planned to build a private altar with his victim's skulls that he hoped would be a place where he felt at home. Dahmer's trial began in January of 1992. Given that a majority of Dahmer's victims were African-American, there was a considerable race tension, so strict security protocol was taken, which included an eight-foot barrier of bulletproof glass that separated Dahmer from the gallery. The inclusion of only one African-American person on the jury invoked more unrest. 
It is noted that Lowell Dahmer and his second wife were there every day during the trial. Dahmer initially pled not guilty to all charges, despite having confessed to killing during police interrogation. He eventually changed his plea to guilty by virtue of insanity. His defense then offered the gruesome details of his behavior as proof that only someone insane could commit such horrible acts. The jury chose to believe the prosecution that Dahmer was fully aware of the acts of evil he committed. And on February 15, 1992, they returned after approximately 10 hours of de deliberation with a ruling of guilty. And they ruled him sane on all counts. He was sentenced to 15 consecutive life terms in prison with a 16th term that was later added. Dahmer reportedly adjusted well to prison life at the Columbia Correctional Institute in the South Central Wisconsin. Though he was initially kept apart from the general population, he eventually convinced authorities to allow him to integrate more fully with the other inmates. He said he found religion in the form of books and photos that his father sent him. A disturbing and interesting fact is that Jeffrey Dahmer was baptized in prison on May 10th of 1994, the same day another serial killer, John Wayne Gacy, was sentenced to death using lethal injection. Oh, and if that's not strange enough, it was also a solar eclipse that day. Chilling. It is chilling to realize when Dahmer was sentenced in February of 1992, there was over 28 active serial killers in the United States alone. Less than two years after his sentencing, Dahmer was killed on November 28, 1994 by his fellow prison inmate, Christopher Scaver. In accordance with his inclusion in regular work details, Dahmer was assigned to work with two other convicted murderers. After they had been left alone to complete their tasks, guards returned to find one of the men had brutally beaten Dahmer and the other inmate with a metal bar from the prison weight room. Dahmer was pronounced dead after approximately one hour. Anderson, the other inmate, died from his injuries days later. After being taunted by Dahmer and Anderson during their work detail, Scarver said that he confronted Dahmer about his crimes before beating the two men to death. While in prison, Dahmer still made disturbing jokes by making his food look like body parts and then using ketchup to resemble blood. I am shocked nobody killed him sooner. In 1996, following Dahmer's death, a group of Milwaukee businessmen raised more than $400,000 to purchase the items Dahmer used in his crimes, including blades, saws, handcuffs, and the refrigerator he stored body parts in. They then promptly destroyed them in an effort to distance the city from the horrors of Dahmer's actions. In August 2012, nearly two decades after his death, it was reported that Dahmer's childhood home where he committed his first murder in 1978 and buried his victim's remains in the backyard was on the market. The house was removed and believed to be owned by the same owners as of 2022. Both of Dahmer's parents and his stepmother all passed away after his death in 1994. And at the age of 55, David is allegedly still alive although there is no public record of his new identity. According to his father and stepmother, he has a good career, a wife, and two children. Since 2004, when this image was taken, there has been no further updates on David Dahmer. There are a few things not very many people know about Jeffrey Dahmer. The first is that he was obsessed with Star Wars and wore yellow contact lenses in the hopes to resemble the Return of the Jedi villain, the Emperor. Numerous singers include Jeffrey Dahmer in their lyrics, which cause many fans to criticize their old songs. These artists include Katy Perry and Kesha. 
One of the most interesting things that I learned about Jeffrey Dahmer was that although there are many images of him wearing his aviator yellow tint glasses, according to his stepmother, he refused to wear them during the trial because he didn't want to be able to see anyone's faces. Dahmer only wore them at his sentencing of 16 consecutive life terms or 957 years in prison. Unfortunately, there are some people that are not horrified by Dahmer's actions. One such person was a Louisiana man that was sentenced to 45 years in federal prison for attempting to murder a gay man in a copycat killing inspired by Jeffrey Dahmer. Between 1991 and 2023, there have been numerous TV shows, movies, and books documenting the horrid events that occurred in Jeffrey Dahmer's life. In my final words about Jeffrey Dahmer, I will leave you with one of the most disturbing things he said, which is the meat of his victims tasted like filet mignon. I'm not sure about you guys, but I think I just became a vegetarian. On a scale of one to five, on the sadistic barf creepy scale, I am giving Jeffrey Dahmer a five out of five. He makes me question humanity. Now, don't forget to subscribe and like, because up next is the co-ed killer, Ed Kemper. Serial killer Ed Kemper murdered six young women and several members of his own family in Santa Cruz, California. Kemper was born on December 18, 1948 in Burbank, California. He was the middle child of E.E. E. Kemper and Cornell Kemper. After his parents divorced in 1957, he moved with his mother and two sisters to Montana. Kemper's mother was an alcoholic and she was very critical of him and he blamed her for all of his problems. When he was 10, his mom forced him to live in the basement away from his sisters as she feared that he might hurt them. Signs of trouble began to emerge early. Kemper would also cut off the heads of his sister's dolls and then coerce the girls to play a game he called Gas Chamber. Wow, that is messed up. In this horrific game, he would blindfold himself and then have his sisters tie him to a chair where he would pretend to shake in agony until he was, quote unquote, dead. Kemper also had other dark fantasies, sometimes dreaming about killing his mother, something that later would become a reality. Kemper's first victim was not a person, but the family cat. At 10, he buried one of them alive, and the second one Kemper killed when he was 13 by slaughtering it with a knife. It was then that his mother sent him to live with his father, then he was sent to live with his paternal grandparents in North Folk, California. Kemper hated living on his grandparents' farm. Before going to North Folk, he had already begun learning about firearms, but his grandparents took away his rifle after he killed several birds and other small animals. Then on August 27, 1964, Kemper finally turned his building rage on his grandparents. The 15-year-old shot his grandmother in the kitchen after an argument, and then when his grandfather returned home, he shot him outside by his car and hid the body. Kemper then called his mother, who told him to call the police and tell them what had happened. Kemper would later say that he shot his grandmother to see what it felt like. He added that he killed his grandfather so that the man wouldn't have to find out that his wife had been murdered. For his crimes, Kemper was handed over to the California Youth Authority. He underwent various tests, which determined that he had a very high IQ, but also suffered from paranoid schizophrenia. Kemper would eventually be sent to the state hospital, a maximum security facility for mentally ill convicts. In 1969, Kemper was released at the age of 21 despite the prison doctor's recommendation that he not live with his mother because of past abuse and his psychological issues 
revolving around her. Yet he rejoined her in Santa Cruz, California, where she had moved at the end of her third marriage. While there, Kemper attended community college for a time, worked various jobs, and eventually ended up with employment with the Department of Transportation in 1971. Kemper had applied to become a state trooper, but he was rejected because of his size. He weighed around 300 pounds and was six feet, nine inches tall, which led to his nickname, Big Ed. Kemper did hang around many Santa Cruz police officers. One gave him a training badge and handcuffs, while another let him borrow a gun. Kemper even had a car that resembled a police cruiser. I understand it was 1970, but none of this is okay. Then, the same year that Kemper began working for the highway department, he was hit by a car while on his motorcycle. His arm was badly injured and he received $15,000 in settlement against the car's driver. While Kemper was unable to work, his mind went in other pursuits. He noticed a large number of young women hitchhiking in the area. In the new car he bought with some of the settlement money, Kemper began storing the tools he thought he might need to fulfill his murderous desires, including a gun, a knife, and those handy police handcuffs. Between May of 1972 and April of 1973, Kemper butchered five college students, a high school student, his mother, and her best friend. He raped his first victim, had sexual intercourse with the bodies of the next five, and had sex with his mother's head. If anybody's questioning if this guy is sick and deranged, there's your proof. At first, Kemper picked up female hitchhikers and let them go. However, when he offered a ride to two Fresno State students outside of Berkeley, California on May 7th, 1972, Mary Ann Pierce and Anita Luchessa would never make it to their destinations. Their families reported them missing soon after their disappearance. Kemper brought the women to a wooded area nearby, intending to rape them, but he panicked and stabbed and choked the two women to death instead. He then stuffed them into his truck and drove to his house in Alameda, California. On the way, a cop stopped him for a broken taillight, tail but did not search the car. If they had, they would have found the body of Ed Kemper's victims inside. He is not the first serial killer to be stopped by the police when they had a body in their car. The same thing happened to Ted Bundy. Once home, Kemper raped the bodies. He then dismembered them, engaged in sexual activity, placed the body parts into plastic bags, and disposed of them. Ed Kemper's victims were hidden somewhere near the mountains outside of Santa Cruz. Unfortunately, nothing would be known of these girls' fate until August 15th, when a female head was discovered in the woods near Santa Cruz and would later be identified as Pierce's head. Unfortunately, Anita's body or remains were never found. Later that year, on September 14, 1972, Kemper picked up 15-year-old Aiko Ku, who had decided to hitchhike rather than wait for the bus to take her to dance class. Unfortunately, she would meet the same fate as the other two women. During this encounter, Kemper accidentally locked himself out of his car, but was able to persuade the young teenage girl to let him back inside the car. He then choked her unconscious, raped her, and killed her. This is another example of how he used his high level of intelligence to commit horrific crimes. After stuffing Ku's body in his trunk, Kemper later recounted to police officers that he looked down at his latest kill with pride. He said that he admired his catch like a fisherman. Kemper soon began to take extra risks just for additional thrills. He began hanging out at a bar called the Jury Room, which was popular with police officers. 
he would hang out with his friends who were local cops, the ones that called him Big Ed. Kemper would explain that he enjoyed being so close to the people trying to catch him. Kemper moved back with his mother in 1973, and he murdered three more college students he picked up at the local campuses. In January of 1973, Kemper continued to act on his murderous impulses, picking up hitchhiker Cindy Shao, who he would shoot and kill. Then, while his mother was out, Kemper went to her home and hid Shao's body in his room. He dismembered her corpse, and the following day, he threw the parts of her body into the ocean. Several parts were later discovered when they washed up on shore. He did not throw away all of her body in the ocean, though. He buried her head in his mother's backyard, with it looking up at his mother's room. Wow, he truly hated his mother. On February 5th, 1973, Kemper used a campus parking sticker he took from his mother to facilitate a double murder. He drove to UCSC and offered a ride to two students, Rosalind Thorpe and Alice Leo. Shortly after picking them up, he shot the two young women and then drove past the campus security at the gate with the two mortally wounded women in his car. After the murders, Kemper decapitated his two victims and further dismembered the bodies. Kemper was smart enough to know to remove the bullets from their head and dispose of their parts in different locations. In March, some of Thorpe's and Leo's remains were discovered by hikers near Highway 1. When Kemper was committing these horrific crimes, two other serial killers were also killing in Santa Cruz, causing the city to be nicknamed the murder capital of the world. For Kemper's part, he was dubbed the co-ed killer or the co-ed butcher. For Kemper, everything accumulated on April 20th, 1973, Good Friday. He went to his mother's home where the two had a very unpleasant exchange. Kemper then bludgeoned his mother to death with a claw hammer while she was sleeping. He then decapitated her and raped her severed head before using it as a dartboard. He also screamed at the head for over an hour straight. In truth, Kemper's mother had been the real target the whole time. Kemper stated, my victims represent not what my mother was, but what she liked and what was important to her. And I wanted to destroy that. As if it weren't enough, Kemper also cut out her tongue and larynx and placed them in the garbage disposal. But the mechanism wouldn't break down the tissue properly and it spit her remains back into the sink. Kemper stated later that that seemed appropriate as much as she liked to bitch and scream and yell at me all these years. After Kemper hid his mother's body parts, he then called his mother's best friend over to the house with the idea of a cover story. Kemper thought that he could say that his mother and her friend went on a vacation together. Kemper then murdered Sally, and stole her car. Kemper fled the area the next day, driving east until he reached Pueblo, Colorado, certain that he would soon see the two murders on the news. But after not hearing anything for a while, on April 23rd, Kemper made a call to the Santa Cruz Police Department, confessing his crimes. At first, they didn't believe that the guy they knew as Big Ed was a killer, but during subsequent interrogation, he would lead them to all the evidence they needed to prove that he was, in fact, the infamous co-ed killer. When the police asked Kemper why he stopped killing and turned himself in, Kemper said it wasn't serving any physical or real emotional purpose anymore. It was just a pure waste of time. Emotionally, I couldn't handle it much longer. Then he continued telling the police towards the end I started feeling the whole damn thing was just exhausting. And I just said, what the hell with it? I'm calling it all off. Kemper was charged with eight counts of first degree murder 
and he went on trial for his crimes in October of 1973. After he was found sane and guilty, he was charged in early November. When asked by the judge what he thought his punishment should be, Kemper said that he should be tortured to death. Capital punishment was suspended in California at that time. So he instead is serving eight concurrent life sentences. Kemper is currently serving his time in a California medical facility in Vacaville, California. I agree with him. He should have been tortured to death. There have been numerous books and movies made about Ed Kemper, as people are still fascinated by this serial sexual sadist. In the final words about Ed Kemper, I will leave you with one of the most disturbing things he said, which is one side of me says, I'd like to talk to her, date her. The other side of me says, I wonder what her head would look like on a stick. Wow. Ed Kemper was the second sicko in this week's Serial Killer Iceberg. Do you know the theme of the week yet? Similar to Dahmer, I would give Kemper a 5 out of 5 on the sadist barf creepy scale. Now, stay tuned for our third sicko, a killer that you likely have not heard about, but will leave you wanting to sleep with the lights on. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share, because up next is Peter Curtin, a German serial killer that murdered at least nine people before surrendering to police in 1931. Peter Curtin was born in Germany in 1883. His parents were impoverished and abusive, and the family lived in a one-bedroom apartment that they all shared. Curtin was born into extreme poverty in the suburbs of Germany, May 26, 1883. He was the eldest of 13 children. Yes, 15 people lived in a one-bedroom apartment. His father was an alcoholic and had sadist tendencies and beat both his wife and the children. This daily submission to sexual violence must have had an immense influence on the boy who at age nine formed an unhealthy relationship with a dog catcher living in the same building. I think you know where this is going. This relationship introduced him to the practice of bestiality carried out initially on dogs. Curtin's first murder is one that he claimed but is yet to be confirmed. It was that he drowned two school friends at the age of nine, having pushed one of them overboard as the second dove in to rescue him. Curtin held them both underwater until they suffocated and drowned to death. At the time, the event was dismissed as a tragic childhood accident. As Curtin matured sexually, his bestiality extended to sheep, goats, and other farm animals. As a teenager, he discovered that he gained extra pleasure when the animal was stabbed during intercourse. What a completely disturbed person. By 1899, at the age of 16, Curtin had progressed to petty crimes and ran away from home to escape the continued violence. Shortly after his departure, his father was arrested for an incestuous relationship with Curtin's 13-year-old sister, and he was jailed for three years. Curtin's petty crimes soon led to the first of many short prison sentences for various misdemeanors that punctuated his existence over the following years. The appalling conditions within the prison helped to confirm his sadist tendencies, which he now transferred from farm animals to humans. With each prison sentence, Curtin's rage against society increased and his as his captivity increased. He discovered a fascination with brutal sexual acts while in solitary confinement, which enhanced his fantasies so much that he began to break prison rules to ensure the maximum time in solitary confinement. It is officially regarded that Peter Curtin began murdering people in 1913. In the publicity surrounding his killings, he became known as the Dusseldorf vampire, as it was thought that he drank his victim's blood. During his periods 
of release between prison sentences. He was responsible for various sexual assaults, but his first documented murder victim was 10-year-old Kristen Keene. She was sexually assaulted and stabbed in her home on May 25, 1913, while her parents worked at their pub below her bedroom. Curtin was called up for military service following the start of World War I, but military discipline did not suit him, and he deserted from his barrack. He was captured and jailed and remained in prison until 1921. This was the longest sentence to date, and his rage at this injustice only increased. Following his release from prison, he met and married a former prostitute who had been jailed for the murder of her fiance. He spent the next four years living a life of relative normalcy. This normality was short-lived as Curtin's crimes escalated and reached its peak in the killing of a nine-year-old on February 9th, 1929. She was stabbed 13 times by Curtin, who climaxed during the brutal attack before he dumped her body under a hedge and then attempted to set fire to her remains to destroy the evidence. The child was the first of a number of victims that included young girls, women, and even men over the next 15 months. Curtin would often return to the scene of the crime to relive the moments. At times, he even spoke with detectives about the murders. By August 1929, they arrested the wrong man, a learning disabled individual, and then it became apparent that they had convicted the wrong person. While he was in custody, Curtin killed three more people before the man was arrested. Attacks became more frequent and were widely publicized. A servant girl was battered to death on October 12, 1929. Two other victims survived brutal hammer attacks. Curtin enjoyed the mass hysteria and he fed off of the press attention even going as far as to contact the newspaper on November 9th, 1929, with a map detailing the positions of the body of his latest victim, a five-year-old he had stabbed to death two days before, dumping her body under some rubble. Curtin's attacks continued into the spring of 1930, but none were fatal, serving only as an escalator of horror. May 14, 1930, a chain of events occurred that would result in Curtin's eventual capture. He offered a young, unemployed woman, Maria, somewhere to stay and took her to his apartment, hoping to have sex with her. When she refused and he agreed to find her somewhere else to stay, but on returning to her train station, he took her into the nearby forest and raped her before letting her go. Throughout Curtin's reign of terror, he maintained a fond attraction to his wife. I can't believe he is still married. And he recognized that he would eventually be caught. He confessed to her that he was the Dulcodorf vampire, detailing all of the killings and attacks. And he insisted that she would be paid a large reward for turning him over to the authorities. On May 24, 1930, Curtin's wife reluctantly did as her husband told her, and she took the police to a local church where Curtin surrendered quietly. Once under arrest, he provided an astonishing detailed account of his string of crimes. He claimed 79 individual crimes and went to great lengths to convince the authorities of his guilt perhaps in the hopes that his full cooperation would ensure the maximum financial benefit for his wife. His memory was nearly photographic when it came to the accounts of his crimes. Curtin's trial was on April 13, 1931, on charges including nine murders and seven attempted murders. At the trial, Curtin claimed that his childhood in the German penal system was responsible for his sadist tendencies, and he showed no remorse for his crimes. The jury took only 90 minutes to return a verdict of guilty on all counts, and Curtin received nine death sentences. He was executed by guillotine on July 2, 1931. 
The last words were reportedly, tell me after my head is chopped off, will I still be able to hear, at least for a moment, the sound of my own blood gushing from the stump of my neck? That would be the pleasure to end all pleasures. What a weirdo. Fun fact, Curtin's head is on display at Ripley's Believe It or Not in Wisconsin. Peter Curtin was the third sicko of this week's serial killer iceberg. Have you figured out the theme yet? Similar to Dahmer and Kemper, this crazy killer would earn a five out of five on the sadist barf creepy scale. This man you must keep away from everyone, including the family pets. Now, stay tuned for our fourth sicko, a killer that is the first known serial sexual murderer of the 20th century. And don't forget to subscribe, like, and share because up next is Earl Nelson, San Francisco's own guerrilla killer. Earl Nelson began his life in despair at less than two years old living in San Francisco in 1897. His parents both died of syphilis causing him to go live with his maternal grandparents. The Nelsons lived a Puritan lifestyle and sought to repress emotions, feelings, and especially sexual desires. That sounds like a healthy way to live. At the age of seven, he was kicked out of school for bad behavior, and he was also caught watching his cousin undress. Then at the age of 10, he was riding his bike when he got in an accident with a streetcar or he got run over by a streetcar. After several days in a coma, he did survive, but had a massive head injury, which most likely changed him. And as you will find out, not for the better. At the age of 21, Nelson's criminal habits became more apparent as he sought a way to break free from his oppressive upbringing. On May 19, 1921, he pretended to be a plumber so that he could enter a San Francisco home and molest a 12-year-old girl. However, she screamed and her father beat Nelson, but he was still able to flee. Luckily, he was arrested hours later. At his hearing, authorities deemed that he was dangerous and remanded to the Napa State Mental Hospital. I don't think he was going to be able to enjoy any wine tasting when he was in Napa. He stated that he heard voices and believed that people were constantly trying to poison him. Most likely he was suffering from schizophrenia. However, that was not a widely diagnosed condition until the 1950s. At the hospital, he threatened to kill the medical staff. So the doctors recommended that he stay there permanently. Clearly, he did not take well to this, so rather than sit there and wait out the rest of his life, he quickly escaped. And his murder spree started in October of 1925 in Philadelphia. Within three weeks, three women were strangled to death. All died in their homes after being strangled by Nelson. Each of their bodies was sexually assaulted after they were dead and each home had a room for rent sign in the window. Clearly, he has a specific MO. Some authorities did not officially attribute these victims to Earl Nelson, but some of the crime's common elements, such as the knots that were used to bind the victims, for example, match those of his later crimes. A few months later, in February of 19. 26, Nelson returned to San Francisco and began killing more unsuspecting women. Five more women died from February to August, and all of the cases had the same pattern. A middle-aged woman who put room up for rent was strangled to death and then raped, and some of their possessions were later sold off. But the killer was still never found. There were some witnesses who saw a possible perpetrator in San Francisco. A few people described the assailant as a dark, stocky man with long arms and huge hands. This description is what got him nicknamed the Gorilla Man. 
Others called him the Dark Strangler because of his specific way of killing. Later in 1926 and into 1927, authorities began to notice more strangulations and sexual assault cases similar to the ones in San Francisco. They ranged all over the country, including Oregon, Iowa, Chicago, Missouri, New York, and even Canada. In Winnipeg, Canada, Nelson murdered two victims. One of them was Lola Cohen, just 14 years old. On June 8th, Nelson killed, sexually assaulted, and mutilated her before stuffing her body under the bed and then sleeping the night in that very bed. The other Canadian victim, Emily Patterson, managed to pull a handful of his hair from his head before she succumbed to strangulation on June 10th, 1927. The next day, he decided to go pawn some of Emily and her husband's belongings that he had stolen from the scene, and then go get a sh shave and a haircut. It seems like nothing faced him. The police were able to track the stolen goods and then with the pawnbroker's help, retrace Nelson's steps from the pawn shop to the barber shop, where the proprietor told authorities that Nelson looked like he had blood on his scalp from where Emily Patterson had grabbed his hair. Believing that this man's description and his MO matched information they'd received from other police departments about the gorilla man, the police figured that they were after this infamous serial killer and set out to find him. The murderer rented a room from another unsuspecting woman on the night of June 12, 1927. But the next morning, he saw his description in the newspaper. He realized it was time to ditch the remaining stolen goods and leave town. Accounts of the manhunt for Nelson vary somewhat, but what we do know is that a civilian reported a sighting of him on June 16th, and the police were able to catch him. However, he was able to pick the locks on his cell and escape. This man was a regular Houdini. Nelson was quickly captured the next day, when a policeman spotted him trying to board a train and he was charged with murder after his fingerprints and teeth marks matched those found at some of the crime scenes. Authorities claimed that Nielsen killed at least 22 people across the United States and Canada over the span of 20 months from the fall of 1925 to the summer of 1927. The true number of his victims varies and is likely much higher. After a short trial, Canadian authorities executed Nielsen in Winnipeg on January 13, 1928. He was the worst known serial killer at the time in terms of sheer number of victims. As to why he killed all these women, doctors and law enforcement officers at the time never really settled on a firm reason and even disagree as to whether or not he was actually sane. Whatever his motives and his true number of victims, Earl Nielsen was America's most prolific murderer until the 1970s, by which point the true age of serial killers began. Earl Nielsen was the fourth sicko on this week's serial killer iceberg. Have you figured out the theme of the week yet? Similar to Dahmer, Kemper, and Curtin, this crazy killer also gets a five out of five on the sadist barf creepy scale. Now don't forget to like, share, and subscribe because we have one more sick. Now stay tuned for our honorable mention in this iceberg. Up next, we have Anthony Marino, a young man who had sex with a 92 year old dead woman. Anthony Marino is not a serial killer, that is why he is only our honorable mention. Marino worked as a lab tech at a hospital in New Jersey. He had another part-time job as a lab assistant at another hospital. Anthony was working those two jobs to help support his mother who suffered from Alzheimer's and his father who was suffering from colon cancer. 
Now, don't get too excited. I know you want to like him. But wait, he's disgusting. For two weeks, Anthony Marino worked well. Nobody complained about him, but that all changed on October 28, 2007, when he told a security guard that he needed to get into the morgue to check some human tissue samples, and his morgue key wasn't working. The guard let him into the morgue and continued his rounds. On his way back, the guard went inside the morgue and found Marino having sex with the corpse of a 92-year-old woman. Yes, you heard me right. He was having sex with the dead body of a 92-year-old woman. The security guard immediately called the police. And when the police arrived, they reportedly found Marino frantically washing his penis. Oh, now that he was caught, he thinks it's gross. Marino was immediately arrested and charged with desecrating human remains, a second degree crime in New Jersey. How is that only a second degree crime? He was found guilty in September of 2008 and sentenced to seven years in prison. However, under a complex plea deal, he received a reduced sentence. During his trial, two psychiatrists said in separate reports that Marino needed psychological help and part of the plea agreement was therapy. Marino has now been released, so I would keep your eye out for this winner. Anthony Marino, our honorable mention and final sicko. He did not kill anyone that we know of, but he did have sex with someone's 92-year-old grandmother's corpse. There is so much wrong with that. Because he is not a serial killer, but because he thinks it's okay to have sex with a corpse, he is going to get a 4.25 out of 5 on the sadistic barf creepy scale. Did you figure out the theme? The theme was that all of these men are necrophiliacs. Thank you for watching and remember to subscribe, like, and share. Stay tuned for the next Serial Killer Iceberg. And remember, once I have enough subscribers,